I am Janet Griffin, and I am the Director of Alumni Relations at NYU Myers. I have worked closely with ANSO and the NYU Myers Recent Alumni Council to host the program tonight. And for those of you who will be graduating next week, I would like to say a big congratulations to you for finishing your degree during this very challenging time over the last year. Uh, we are very proud of you and very excited for you to join our alumni community. And to all of our recent alumni oh. here attendance, I hope this panel will help direct the next steps in your career. So there's a lot of curiosity about what it is like the first year as a nurse practitioner. So there's always a lot of questions about how you build your confidence as a provider or how you interact with your new colleagues or what is the job search like versus how it was like as an RN. So today we have several nurse practitioner alumni that are going to speak about their transition from being a registered nurse to a nurse practitioner. So I'll go ahead and introduce our panelists. Bob Abel received his master's and DNP from NYU Myers. He is a psychiatric nurse practitioner in private practice and at the NYU Student Health Center. He is also an adjunct assistant professor at the Psychiatric Nurse Practitioner Program at Hunter College School of Nursing. Pam Bassani graduated in 2012 with a master's in nursing as a pediatric nurse practitioner. She works as a primary care clinician with ProHealth in Long Island, where she diagnoses, treats, and manages sick and well children. Her initial career as an NP was in cardiothoracic surgery and included heart transplantation. Joe Curto graduated from NYU in 2017 from the Adult Gerontology Acute Care Nurse Practitioner Program, and he currently works at Mount Sinai Hospital within the Institute for Critical Care Medicine covering rapid response, MICU, and CCU. He also taught undergraduate clinicals at NYU for two semesters and currently precepts NP students at work, and Joe is also a member of our recent alumni council. So Ken Zafra graduated from NYU in 2013 with her bachelor's in nursing and then again in 2019 with her master's in nursing as an acute care nurse practitioner with a specialty in palliative care. She's now a critical care nurse practitioner who currently works at Mount Sinai Hospital on the rapid response team and in the medical ICU. So if you have questions during tonight's panel, please type them into the chat. We will get to as many as we can during the Q&A. Uh, go on ahead and mute yourself if you haven't already. And uh, when the panel concludes, we will actually have the opportunity to go into breakout rooms with our panelists so that you can speak to them one-on-one -on -one and ask some specific questions about their experience. So I'm gonna turn the program over to Giselle Perez and she is the president of ANSO and she's also a current student in the Psychiatric Mental Health NP Master's program. So go ahead. Everyone, um, thank you for joining on a Friday night, and I'm sure many have finals or um, upcoming graduations, so thank you for being here. Um, so my name is Giselle, and we'll start off with um, having each of the panelists just share their professional backgrounds and career paths and what they're currently doing now. So Bob, would you like to start off? Oh, uh, let's see, make sure I'm, I unmuted myself. Hi, I'm uh, Dr. Bob Abel, and I've been a nurse for about 150 years, and I've uh, been a nurse practitioner for 13, uh, went to the, the adult psychiatric nurse practitioner program at NYU, and was in the first uh, cohort of the DMP program um, that started in 2010 at NYU. And I'm also a former president of ANSO, I have to say that as well. Um, and I'm currently working in a mostly outpatient setting. I've been at the Student Health Center at NYU for all the years. Uh, I started right after I, uh, I did my clinical there and I started there as a nurse practitioner and there I am still. But along with that, I have a small private practice. I teach at Hunter and I've done some other things here and there along the way. And uh, outpatient is really my focus. Although my RN background was inpatient psychiatry. Thank you, Bob. Um, let's have Pam, if you'd like to introduce yourself. I make sure I'm unmuted, I am. Hi everyone, I'm Pam Bacani. Um, I'm a nurse practitioner with ProHealth in Long Island. I currently work in a primary care office, a very busy one, um, that where I do a lot of diagnosis, I do a lot of collaboration with the physicians. Um, initially though, I actually, I worked bedside for close to 10 years, about eight years. Um, I've actually been practicing, despite the fact that I graduated in 2012, I've actually only started practicing as an NP in 2016. 
I did uh, cardiothoracic surgery at Montefiore uh, for about three years. And then when I moved out to Long Island, I worked with um, an urgent care fellowship, PM Pediatrics, uh, for a short time. And then I ended up finding my home with ProHealth in Long Island. So I've been doing this now. I've been with ProHealth about two years. Um, and I'm enjoying what I'm doing right now. Thank you, Pat. <laughs> um, we can have Joseph. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Joseph Curdo. Um, I've been a nurse since 2008, beginning of 2009 is when I started. Uh, originally from upstate Syracuse, was on cardio step-down type floor, um, did that, and then I did travel contracts for numerous years, ended up in New York City. Um, I currently work at Mount Sinai Hospital where I was a nurse there and I took a travel contract there, stayed permanent. <laughs> and then graduated from NYU in 2017 with the acute care degree and transitioned into the job there. Um, Kim and I both, we work for the Institute for Critical Care Medicine. We cover the medical ICU, the cardiac ICU and rapid response. Um, so any given time we're scheduled on one of the three services. And then we also do pop-up ICUs because lately now with COVID, our MICU was all COVID and we needed extra space for non-COVID medical ICU patients. So. Thank you, Joseph. And then mm -hmm. perfect transition for Kim. So Kim, would you like to share? Hi, my name is uh, Kim Zafra. I had been a nurse for about seven years, um, most recently in the medical ICU at Mount Sinai. I officially graduated um, from NYU September 2019 from the acute care uh, NP program, um, and then also specialized in the pal in palliative care. For COVID reasons, I only recently started uh, working as an NP um, and have been working as an NP for about five or six months now. So I'm obviously relatively new, um, but I went through what a lot of you may be going through very soon. So hopefully I can give some insight and advice uh, into the coming months for all of you. Uh, currently, like Joe was saying, uh, we are uh, NPs with the rapid response team and we also rotate in the medical ICU and cardiac ICU and also pop-up ICUs where we serve as the primary providers. Um, thank you, Kim. So the next question is, how did you prepare for your boards and kind of comparing them um, from RN boards, which is the NCLEX and MP boards, which are like board certifications and um, whatever specialty um, we studied. So for that, actually, we'll stay with Kim. Maybe like to answer that question. Sure. So, I mean, my experience would be very acute care uh, specific, but I did the Barclays review. It's, we, I did a two day in-person class. I don't know if they're still doing in-person reviews, but I did a two day in-person class um, review. And then I think I took the boards about two months after I was done, done with both my acute care and palliative care classes. And during that two month time, I was like very regimented. I had like the schedule to go over all the topics um, in this review book that you were given for Barclays. Uh, and while going over each section, I would like write down the values, just like key points that I wanted to review right before I took the test so I could just quickly look at it. Um, and then between those review sessions, I took these practice tests that Barclay offers and you may actually have to pay for them, but I, I personally thought it was really, really helpful because it helped me practice not only endurance because the, the test is about four or five hours. So you get really tired um, after a few questions, but it, it allowed me to figure out what I knew, what I didn't know and like what I needed to review again. So that's how I um, prepared for my boards as an NP. You can. Yeah. And just piggybacking off of that with what Kim is saying, like she, she the test is tiring because unlike the NCLEX, uh, the test is not shut off. You have to finish and do every single question. I think, what is it, Kim? 175, something like that. Um, yeah, so you have to end up doing the complete exam regardless. Unlike the NCLEX also, you know immediately right after if you passed or failed. Um, so, uh, one other thing I could say is I attest to the Barclays 
review um, if you can do in person, but hopefully he does a live session if it is virtual because it's very, very, very helpful. Um, the NCLEX questions I feel compared to the MP boards, I felt the MP boards were more direct and it, you know, you have to know your stuff, but they didn't feel like as if they were trying to trick you in any which way or anything like that. As long as you knew what you were uh, doing and like knew your, like she can set values and knew your different uh, systems and whatnot. Great, thank you. Uh, moving on to the next question. It is, uh, what was the process of finding an NP job and the interview procedure? Um, was it, did you feel you had to find a job quickly right after graduation or did you say, take some time to look for a job as many of us are employed as our as RNs while we're also in MP school? Um, so this will go to Pam, maybe you'd like to answer first. Sure. Uh, so I don't know if I mentioned, I'm a pediatric NP. Um, I have done pediatrics my entire career uh, from bedside as, as an, an up to NP. And I graduated from the primary care program through NYU. So I actually found that the, the best way to kind of think about, sorry, <laughs> um, is, sorry, one second. Sorry, can you repeat the question there? Sure. I had a point that I kind of like lost my thought, my train of thought where I was going. Okay, it's kind of speaking to what was um, the job interview process and the just job searching process and kind of like, did you feel pressured to look for a job as some of us work as RNs currently or um, just kind of what was that process like for you? So as I had mentioned, I had worked at Montefiore for several years. Um, and actually when I entered school at NYU, I knew my kind of dream job was that I wanted to get into cardiothoracic surgery. So one thing I would definitely suggest is if you are in a big facility, regardless of if you're an RN or you're looking for a brand new NP job, is try and see if you can find your way through a big facility. Um, because there's usually a lot of movement that you can, that is easier to come by within a big, within a big hospital. Um, and so I worked as an ICU nurse uh, for four years before I ended up finally transitioning to an NP position at Montefiore. And I actually found that trans transition to be helpful for me because it helped. Um, I knew the system. I knew, um, I knew how to get there. <laughs> it was easy to get there. Um, and I definitely would say if you can, if you can start in a big facility, that'll give you the movement. A lot of places, a lot of are gonna, are likely to hire from within the hospital first than to try and get into a brand new facility altogether. So you wanna be able that, to see if, that you can get some virality or in this case promoted. Um, if you're trying to go the route of like, as Joe and Kim went, where you're going from an RN to an NP position. So I don't think you necessarily need to do anything extra. I think you it's, it's okay to take your time with it. I definitely would suggest um, before going into an NP program, try and get some bedside experience first. You do want to try and get your feet wet a little bit um, just to kind of know, lower the ropes, really know what you know. Um, because we were actually having a discussion earlier that the expectation coming out of NP school is different than the expectation coming out of RN school coming out of your baccalaureate degree. So it's good to kind of get your feet wet before you jump into things, um, to know what you want, to move around a little bit. Um, and I definitely say, again, if you're in a big facility, they're more likely to give you movement within, within the facility in order to try and find where your niche kind of hits. Um, I happen to be fortunate that like, I started in pediatrics, I ended up loving pediatrics and totally stayed with it. Um, there are some people who will tell you the opposite, that they started and they were like, I want to do ICU or I want to do acute care and they did it and they're like, I absolutely hate it. Uh, for myself, being that I'm now in primary care, I'll be honest, I never thought that I was going to actually end up in primary care. But at the time that I was at NYU, there was not an acute care program 
So I did the primary care program just to kind of get it under my belt and then see if later on um, I'd want to transition. So as life kept happening, I now have two young kids. Um, it just kind of felt a little more natural for me to step back from an ICU setting. Um, so I found that transitioning, it's like taking my time to transition to an NP, an NP position was actually the best thing for me. So I definitely would say there's no rush, um, especially if you're still trying to feel out a lot of the different, um, the different subspecialties that you might think you might consider being in. I, I would like to um, second exactly what Giselle said and encourage folks that are still in an NP program in this group that are uh, maybe haven't gone to placements yet or just beginning their clinical placements. If there is a spot where you're placed um, that you feel really good about, encourage through working with your preceptor um, to get connected with the folks that might be more interested in hiring you. If they like you, many of our NP students at Hunter oftentimes end up having their first NP job at the place that they liked the most and got connected to the most during their clinical time as students. I also want to encourage people to take your time. I think so many folks I get feedback from a couple of years after working who are not happy, and that's a small percentage, talk about how they didn't understand exactly what the job entailed and they wish they'd asked a lot more questions. So there's no rush. I know the pressure's on. I want to be an MP, I want to be an MP. But take your time interview and interview them. Let them interview you and you interview the companies and find out in the agencies or the hospitals as much as you can about the, what the job will entail and what they expect from you. I agree. And actually I would say uh, me and Giselle and Janet were speaking about this a few weeks ago. I feel like there's kind of two trains of thought when it comes to getting your nurse practitioner job. Uh, some people say, you know, do like apply for a ton of jobs, go on a bunch of interviews and kind of take the first one you can get to get your experience and whatnot. Um, and then there's the other train of thought where someone like me, where I knew specifically where I wanted to work and my mind thought, like my mindset was I had an RN job already. So I had an income. And at this point, why can't I be a little choosy and take the job that I actually want versus the one that I didn't really want. And then if I decide I don't like the position, I can go elsewhere. And I kind of think that's what Pam was alluding to is being that she's had different experiences and she found out, hey, I really like primary care in the end. Um, so whichever way you choose to go, that's up to you. But I think what we're all just trying to say here is, you know, if you already have an established career as a, a registered nurse, this time around, maybe take your time to really enjoy what you're doing or you want to be doing it, so. I would definitely, just to add to that, say that if you do decide to take your time going into an NP role, try and get into big conferences just to maintain your certifications. Um, mm -hmm. For myself, I like, I graduated 2012. I think I was certified by 2013. But from 2013 to 2016, like I had absolutely zero primary care experience. So I had to, I was working acute care. So it was a very kind of different way to maintain my role. Um, so I tried to take advantage of like the big conferences that were like two or three days to travel so that you met the CEUs required um, and you met the modules. And like, I'm certified through uh, the board called PNCB and through PNCB, like they, they give you like a plan as far as like, this is what your cycle should consist of and this is what you need to complete. Um, and I just had to be mindful of those things to stay on top of them so that I wouldn't lose my certification when I actually went for a primary care uh, position. Thank you, Pam. Um, so the next question is, what was your biggest challenge in your first year as a nurse practitioner? Um, also can touch upon like what resources were available and how did you use those to your advantage um, for this? And like all of the participants, if we can all pitch in and just um, keep it a little short. So anyone who'd like to start. So I, 
for me, I, I was recently, uh, I recently became an NP. Um, I think the biggest challenge for me by far is just building up my confidence. You know, you're not following orders anymore. You have more responsibility and to really know what you're doing. And um, Joe and I work in the rapid response team in Mickey UCCU. Um, and for rapid response, you're usually the first provider at the side. Everyone's kind of looking to you to assess the patient and come up with differentials, like they ask the appropriate questions and it's intimidating, but um, you know, you, you just have to, I just had to figure out this balance of building up my confidence, um, gaining more knowledge, but also knowing when I needed to ask for help because you know, I'm new. So no one expects me to know everything and no one expects, I mean, every day you're learning something new. So just, I think the most important thing is knowing when to ask for help. Mm -hmm. um, I agree with that. Uh, confidence is the uh, big thing. I think like uh, when it comes to being a nurse practitioner, um, you have to stay humble enough, like Kim is saying, to know that you, we don't know everything and we have to ask questions. Um, you know, and to find those resources, you know, rather fellow colleagues or the positions you work with and whatnot, everyone should be open to teaching. We're all on the same team. So we should all want to do what's best for the patient in the end, so. I think the biggest challenge for me in my first year as an NP was reminding myself to allow myself to be a beginner, that I didn't mm -hmm. know everything. I had been an experienced RN for longer than I care to admit. It was very hard for me to take a beginning role as sort of a junior clinician again. And I had to constantly remind myself, just slow down, ask questions, it's okay. Yeah, I agree with that. There was definitely a lot of nights I was coming home feeling like I can't do this job. Can I do this job? Like first days as when I was a registered nurse. Um, but you get through it. Um, and then, like you said, you do have the registered nurse background. So don't sell that short in yourselves. And you do have school because that really will help you be prepared. As far as like getting your confidence and stuff like that, it'll come. You just have to give it time. Yeah, I definitely think you need to lean on, find out the people that you can lean on. Um, being that I literally transitioned from the ICU at Montefiore, like the pediatric ICU where I was taking care of the CT surgical patients to becoming like the actual person that was making orders and inputting and like, and keeping the line, the lines of communication between the ICU to the surgeon to what was happening with the patient was very different. Um, I completely agree with Dr. Bell in that you have to remember to tell yourself, you have to be humbled within, within yourself to know that I am starting this and you're not always going to know everything. And sometimes it helps because fortunately, and I think most of, and all the panelists can agree here that you need to establish a good relationship before you transition into that role, because that is a big part of it. Um, you're, if, the team you used to work for already considers you, considers you part of quote unquote family. It does ease the anxiety a little bit when you're walking onto that unit again. Like for, like I was, when I came back into like an NP position, although I just a week before was still an RN, there was a very different expectation of me. Um, and that's very intimidating, just like had, Kim had mentioned. So humbling yourself to kind of take in that you know, you need to know, these are the things you need to be aware of, these are the things you need to know, this is what you're gonna be responsible for. Um, I personally walked around with a notebook um, in my first couple of weeks, months mm -hmm. probably, that had a lot of my little like tidbits, like this is what I'm responsible for, this is what they expect from me, this is what my responsibilities are to the surgeon, these are my responsibilities to, to the ICU and the physicians and the, the attendings that are on the unit. Um, so I definitely would say that was probably the hardest part about, about transitioning within the same facility, but at the same time, there was always that, that lower love, that underlying comfort that said, like, I know I do belong here because I've belonged here already for X amount of time. So I think that does help with, with easing your mind and transitioning into a bigger role, um, as an NP. Thank you. Um, I think as everyone's mentioning, it kind of reminds me of transitioning into an RN where it's like, you know, it's, it's good to know what you know and like 
what you don't know, you don't know, and you be humble and ask questions. So thank you everyone for sharing. Um, the next question is, if you worked at the same institution as an RN and transitioned to a role as an NP, how did your relationship change with the staff? Um, and how did you handle any difficult, uh, difficulties that arose within like the medical team? Again, especially if you're working within the same institution or even same unit. Um, so Kim, maybe you'd like to answer this question. Sure. Um, actually, this was this particular question was uh, a question that they asked me during my interview uh, because I was a nurse in the MICU and uh, now we rotate in the MICU. So I work directly with the nurses that um, I've been working with for the past few years. Um, so I don't I don't feel like my um, relationship with my colleagues in the MICU necessarily changed. I think when working as a nurse, um, my colleagues and I, we had this deep um, respect for each other and worked really well with each other. So working as an NP, you would think it could be a little awkward because you're in a different role now, but um, it's, I, I feel like a relationship is the same. And I think uh, we all have the patient's safety and health as our priority. Um, and so I think as long as that is everyone's focus, um, it, I don't think there's any anything awkward about it. Um, but I really do stress that communication is key. Um, and I, I feel like a lot of nurses actually feel more comfortable asking um, me questions because they're comfortable with me because I tend to communicate with them um, and it's been really helpful to have that nursing background as a provider um, because I can relate to what the nurses need to do and kind of collaborate with um, the team and the nurses to figure out kind of the balance. Thank you, Kim. I don't know if um, Joseph or Bob or Pam, if you'd like to add, because I know you, a few of you also worked in the same institution as RN and NPs. I, my simple suggestion is that even if you feel nervous and you feel uncomfortable and you feel like people are judging you in this new role, just be yourself. You know, the folks that you work with for months and years are going to be very supportive that they see your education has changed your knowledge base, but not your personality. And you're still a nurse and you're still a colleague and that they can trust that you're going to be pretty much the same person you've always been. Um, Joseph or Pam, anything you'd like to add? I completely agree with what both of them have said. I definitely think um, there is a deep respect. If you've already established that before you transition, um, that will help in a new role. Um, and I do remember like once I had really finally like understood my responsibilities and what I needed to do and what was expected of me, I found my colleagues that I used that I was working with at the bedside that were RNs with me, um, very supportive. And I remember like probably close to a year into the role, I remember one of the, the RNs um, who, she was a little older than me, um, but she was like, Pam, I have to tell you, honestly, she's like, I can see how much you've changed in this role, not in a bad way, um, but just how you've, you've found a way to embrace the role and still maintain who you are, just exactly as Bob had said. Um, I was still able to relate to a lot of the things that happen when you're at the bedside. And as I was mentioning earlier to when we were having a, a separate discussion is that a lot of what I had to do in my job was damage control. Um, damage control in that I was that communication that tied the surgeon to the ICU, to the attendings and everything like that. And there are a lot of times when the visit, when the surgeon would look at me and be like, why can't this be done? Why, what is the problem? I don't understand why it's such a problem. And there's so many times when I had to be like, I know what these nurses are going through. I know what they're capable of. I know what they're dealing with. I was like, I, I've done it. I've lived it. And, and that actually made him more humble about the way he approached the nurses at the bedside because he understood from my perspective, because I could tell them, I'm like, I could, I could be like, I know this is what's going on. And I'm telling you, this is what's going to happen. This is what you need. You have to, these are what your expectations are going to be. And I can tell you that we can, or we cannot deliver them. And that helped to 
even establish my role, my, my um, kind of independence in my clinical role um, to tie that because essentially a, an NP, just like a PA, we're considered mid-level providers, right? So yeah. mid-level providers are expected to be that transition that are supposed to be kind of like in that in-between space. Um, for the time being, and I, I see Bob doesn't quite agree with what I said, but <laughs> there are, I think if you're fairly oh, new <laughs> into the position, <laughs> if you're fairly new into the position, you are, it's, it is a bit of a liaison thing that you need to, you need to um, embrace. I apologize um, for my facial expression, but I do have to say, <laughs> is, <laughs> and this is born on, I'm in a very different part of my career than you guys but I consider the words mid-level provider an insult to the high level of care that we all provide. That's a physician chosen and a recruiting chosen uh, terminology. There's nothing mid-level about what I do and I doubt there's anything mid-level about what any of you do. And that's a doctor's term referring to us and I don't accept it. And I correct people when they say it and they apologize. <laughs> Sorry about that. And I, I didn't mean to- but I should it. apologize. <laughs> It's okay. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, we'll move on to the next question. It's um, if you'd share a little bit about what your orientation or fellowship, et cetera, what was that orientation period like for you? Um, actually, we can go back to Pam if you'd like to share a bit. So I, being that I've done a large gamut of different things, um, it was very different. I mentioned this in the beginning. I think one of the the biggest difference is about RN, like a baccalaureate preparation, new grad position to an NP position is that they expect you to know more as an NP. Um, I was completely out of my realm when I went to urgent care and primary care. I knew surgical, I did surgical IC, I did surgical cardiothoracic IC, like I was in a subspecialty of a subspecialty. So I knew about chest tubes and pacing wires and I knew about like, blood loss and things like that. And like that stuff I could just roll off as far as like what we're needing with blood gases and bed settings and open chest and all the other terminology that comes with cardiothoracic surgery. And, but I was always very focused on the cardiothoracic portion of it. So I, when I went, when I moved out to Long Island um, and I knew that I, didn't quite want to go back to a hospital yet. I did want to see what, what the other side of things look like. So I started out with an urgent care fellowship. I did that for about six months. And what we were discussing earlier is a lot of it, a lot of your orientation can be luck of who's precepting you, who's teaching you, because there are some people who are more than willing to teach you and everything that you need to know. And then there's some that find you more of an annoyance than anything else. But a lot of it just stemmed from the fact that I just simply didn't know. Um, I didn't look in ears and eyes and throats and stomachs the way I did when I worked in the ICU. So that was a huge transition for me. Um, and it turned out, it ended up being one of those things where I had to do extra studying. I had to re-review all those things I had learned in school just to kind of get myself back into the idea of like, I now have to take care of full system. I'm not taking just care of a heart or taking care of, of kidneys or whichever. Um, so that was a big 180 for me. Um, so I ended up finding that urgent care was, although it was what I thought was where I wanted to be because I thought it would be a transition between primary care, primary care and the ICU, it really wasn't. It was a whole separate, um, denomination of nursing that I had to kind of teach myself and learn um, through experience. So when I got connected to ProHealth, I found a very, they were hiring in a very small office with a physician who was just wonderful. He loved the idea of teaching. He was more than willing to take me under his wing. He was more willing to teach me. And I was very straightforward with him at my interview. And I said to him, I'm coming from an ICU background and you can read my CV and you'll see that I have all this experience, but I, I probably couldn't diagnose an ear infection <laughs> as simple as that sounds um, because it's just not something I was, I was doing uh, for, for several years. And so he was very good about trying to get me to 
come in to see every patient and teach me like the pathophysiology behind why this was and this is how it is. And he was very willing to teach me about the little kind of tricks that he had picked up along the way. And I found that, and it was a slow paced office. So it gave me the, the confidence I needed to grow within myself in order to start diagnosing on my own. Um, and then by the time I had kind of like really settled into him, um, I was maybe six, seven months in and he was like, you don't need me anymore. <laughs> so I think it's one of those things where you just need to find an interview. Very important as, as Bob had mentioned that you need to make sure that they're a fit for you also. Um, it's not just mm -hmm. that you're gonna be a fit for them. So I think that's really important. Yeah. Um, and I can kind of piggyback off that for like me and Kim uh, with our service. Um, in particular, like we, uh, I think ours is 12 weeks, I think it is, Kim, right? Yeah, if I remember, uh, it's a 12 week orientation. So three months, um, we tend to, it depends. Like I was lucky enough to get orientation with our manager at the time. Um, Kim's was a little different. She was with one of our colleagues who was a very strong nurse practitioner. Um, and then you tend to be with them uh, for so many weeks and then they try to put you out more and more on your own as you go. Um, it, it's, it's a different transition, like, cause like, you know, we were saying they expect you to know stuff already going into it. Um, in particular on our service with like rapid response and the ICU and stuff, you know, the attendings are just, they're not knowing like maybe what your background is or how long you've been doing this x y and z and it's a very quick transition in that aspect where we have to just learn very quickly and adapt very quickly but I've also come to learn throughout time like which you know positions I could particularly go to more than others and I can learn from them and like even colleagues in general I uh, I rely heavily on them I rely on Kim and Kim relies on you know, yeah. us, because she said she's five, six months in, you know, but we always, I just asked him something the other day, actually, we had a discussion and I'm like, you just, you tend to, I guess in a sense, never stop orienting, if that makes sense. Um, Cause you're always learning. Mm -hmm. So. Thank you. Um... So for our last question before we um, go into Q and A's, uh, what would have been helpful to know before graduation? So what would be helpful for a lot of us that are graduating? Um, any tips, advice, et cetera? Um, Bob, maybe you'd like to answer his question first. But I'm gonna sound a little bit like a broken record. Um, I wish I had, well, I was lucky. I ended up, and I can't say this again, but I will. Um, I ended up working at the place I had my last placement in as an NP student at NYU. And I'm still there many, many, many years later. So I, I had my own kind of residency because I made the transition from student to practitioner in a really familiar environment. People knew me, I knew the system. So I totally agree with other folks have said. Um, the things that I advise my students to do is to consider that, as I've mentioned before, and ask questions. And, and I, I wanna say, I recognize how hard it is to ask questions, whether you're experienced or not in an interview, because you have this idea in your mind that you want a job, maybe you're not working at that time and you really wanna make a good impression. And sometimes in the, the heat of the moment of an interview and you get a real kind of assertive interviewer or you get a whole panel of people, you forget to find out about asking what has to be in place for your needs to be met. Personally, you know, we all know about asking about salaries and benefits and all that, HR handles that. But what about clinically? How are you gonna handle the knowledge gap that you may or may not have as a new graduate? Who's gonna be there for you if you need support? How much will they support you in terms of continuing education? Um, what kind of environment of care are you gonna work in? I mean, ch chances are, if you're a specialist, you're gonna work in that ICU or you're gonna work in pediatrics and you're gonna know a lot about the patients, but do you know about what the staffing is like? Do you know about how many patients you're gonna see? Mm -hmm. And I know you don't wanna interrogate a new per, uh, agency that you're interviewing with, but don't be afraid to ask, is there someone I could get back to 
if I think about some questions later on or who can I address more specific things? And, and just, you know, I always say a sort of handshake and ask questions and don't be too pushy. I was a manager for many years and that used to turn me off. But don't be afraid to stand up for yourself. You deserve the best environment you can get. Um, and sometimes you can find out about it ahead of time. Thank you, Bob. Um, Joseph, would you like to add anything? Um, yeah, I'll just go in with the other maybe kind of stuff. Uh, we were talking about this right before when it comes to, I know when I was in uh, school, um, I don't know if there's any specifically acute care students on the call, um, but I didn't feel I knew or got like a whole uh, discussion as to what involves like once you graduate and all the paperwork and credentialing and stuff like that once you become a nurse practitioner um it can be a little overwhelming uh just you know keep up with it that's my suggestion um especially with you know right after graduation you know you're thinking about boards and stuff and that's great i would rather focus on that but then you do have to remember in order to practice you need like your npi number you need a dea number you have to fill out a lot of forms that go into the state itself. Um, and then even when you get the job after interviewing and to piggyback off what Bob said, if you do find a place that you like, definitely stay in touch with that department or those people. Cause I even was an internal transfer at Mount Sinai and I still had to jump hurdles as an internal transfer to get into the service I'm on. Um, but even afterwards, once you get credential and the credentialing process can be a little tedious itself, just stay on top of it. Um, it does take a while. It'll take anywhere from three to four months. So just to factor all this stuff into when you think about like getting your job, when you can maybe start your job and whatnot. Um, I, I think those were some of the things that I kind of didn't get in school and didn't realize until afterwards and I was like oh wow there's like a lot of things to do even before I can even start practicing um I don't know if Kim or Pam can piggyback off that but Kim since you just kind of went through it yourself so yeah um I completely agree it was it was a little confusing um but I, I relied on my classmates a lot, uh, people who had just gone mm -hmm. through it uh, prior to me. Um, and I don't wanna just say the same things you said. I completely agree with what you said. Something little, uh, maybe not so little, but something that I found out recently is, you know, for like your DEA, your NPI, there are actually some jobs that pay for that because they can get very expensive oh. <laughs> I had no idea yeah I only paid for mine out of pocket but yeah. uh, it's you know it's <laughs> helpful to know that that's a possibility you you can ask if they don't do it then they don't do it but that's a good chunk of money that you could potentially save <laughs> yeah we should probably talk about those fees. I think actually they raised the DEA because I'm renewing mine this summer I think oh, it's like 800 and something now so yeah. and mean, that's I, every I three years yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like, I definitely would agree um, to ask, even during the interview process, like what your educational benefits are um, mm -hmm. as far as like, do they pay you for conference days? Do you get conference days? Um, this can apply any, this can be for an NP or an RN. Um, it's important to kind of know those things and what they're willing to pay for, reimburse for. Mm -hmm. um, when I, like Mon when I was working for Montefiore, they're a very big facility. So they took care of practically most of my expenses. Um, but then when I transitioned out to Long Island and I wasn't working for such a large company anymore, I had to end up paying out a lot of those things. Um, fortunately, I was able to kind of write it off because it's, it's part of your professional stuff in your taxes. But the fact that the facility no longer took care of it for me was like a whole nother line of things I had to think of. Um, so I, I would definitely say like also um, RN or NP, if you can start putting together a file for yourself as far as like transcripts, um, CEUs, um, Mm -hmm. license like well not so much licenses yet but once you start knowing that like you know I have this notebook that kind of takes care of everything, like has all everything in it my CV my resume it just makes it a lot easier especially if you're looking to start interviewing in a lot of places because they're going to ask 
for more or less similar things. Um, and so it's easier to, and even for myself, like when I transitioned um, from Montefiore to an urgent care fellowship to now pro health, like I kept a lot of those files with me because they, they needed them at each position. Like my NPI, my DEA, they needed my licenses, they needed my, um, my graduate, my, um, my diplomas, like all that kind of stuff you want to really keep in a safe place. Um, and if you can file it into a binder, it does make it that much easier to locate it so that when you're at the interviews, when they're asking for whatever they're asking for, it's easy to just pull a lot of that stuff out. Yeah, and that's a good point about the conferences and stuff too, Pam, because just uh, you have to remember like once you get board certified, you have to, to in order to, like to recertify within the five years, you have to have so many uh, CEUs and stuff and like part of it has to be pharmacology and whatnot. Um, so that's good. Like it would be good to know what your facility can or cannot like reimburse or whatnot because conferences can be really expensive. Um, like I know, for example, our acute care one that Barclays does, the guy that does the review session, it's, I think the conference itself is like maybe four or 500. And then if you want to do specialty things too. So it's good to just ask all these questions. Like, um, Bob had was saying too, like, these aren't questions that, you know, are, should sway someone from hiring you or whatnot. I mean, they're, they're practical and logical questions that people should know. So. Great, thank you. Um, so thank you each and every one of you for sharing your work, your work experience, also like your educational experience um, and just general advice for us. So we have about 10, 11 minutes for questions for Q&A. So if anyone in the audience, I guess, would like to ask a question, please feel free to um, type it in the chat. Or I think some people have the option of raising their hand or if you like to jump in um, and I'll be taking a look at the chat to ask our panelists questions. Don't be afraid, there are no silly questions. Everybody's asked them before. Or you can just jump in and ask if you'd like. Um, and then at eight, we'll go into breakout room. Kim, could you share a little bit what question you got during your interview? Sorry, was that, sorry, say it again? Yeah, yeah, I'm just wondering what question did you get during your interview with the rep respond to? Sure, um, I think Joe and I can maybe uh, talk a little about that. The, I was, I was coming to the interview hoping it wouldn't be like clinical questions, but um, and it wasn't, it was more um, general questions. How do you work with a team, your experience? Um, what, the question that I was saying, oh, how, how do you, you think your uh, relationship with your past colleagues would change? Um, one thing for me, it was specifically for my background, I was, cause I did acute care. I specialized in palliative care and they asked why I did palliative care. So. Uh, they looked at my resume and kind of asked specific questions based on my um, past experience. It, it, was, it wasn't that bad of a, an interview, actually. Yeah, um, yeah, I can follow with that. Um, my interview, I'm not quite sure uh, what Kim's was like, like for since we work for the same service. Um, I ended up interviewing with, I think it was four different people. Um, at the time we had our manager of the rapid response team. Uh, I also interviewed with the medical director for the MICU and I interviewed with the director at the time when I first started, we also covered a medical progressive care unit. So I interviewed with that director and then the director of nursing. Um, each interview was, they all had their kind of like nerve wracking kind of parts, but um, you know, some felt more at ease. Like when I was with the medical director, it was more like we were having a conversation. We talked about the different um, things I would see in the medical ICU, the different shock states, stuff like that. 
But then when I was with the director of the medical progressive care unit, it was more like, what's your clinical background? You know, what's your critical care background? It, it was very kind of opposite. Um, I'm, I think Kim might have had a different one because maybe because I also didn't get interviewed by our colleagues, our other NPs that we work with. It was just the manager at the time. And I'm not sure if Kim got interviewed by our other colleagues, but uh, Kim was also a little different too, because we all had worked with her for the most part already. So we already knew like how great she was. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, but I have heard with other services, like I can speak to Mount Sinai, that they, us uh, like ADS Tele, for example, I think uh, Dr. Brennan, the service that she works on is very heavy in clinical knowledge in their interview. Um, I actually had saw a list of the questions that they asked. Um, so I think it all depends on what service you end up uh, interviewing for. But I mean, you have to remember too, they also know you're coming out of school, you're a new graduate you don't know everything like you should know basics obviously because you just graduated school but I, sh I i don't want it to let you trip yourself up because like we said at the end um you know like baba's saying if you be yourself people can see and if you're willing to learn and willing to like go above and beyond and learn um and adapt to whatever is there i don't know if that answered your question i hope it did yeah, I definitely help. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. One thing I'd like to just kind of comment is it's always good to go into an interview um, with at least one or two stories per se um, that might help answer something they might ask you. Um, like when I was when I was interviewing both, I think in both my RN position and my NP position. I had questions that pertain to, can you think of a time when, when you either knew that this is what you wanted to do or an experience that you had that demonstrated that you had the ability to kind of do this position, um, essentially is what it kind of came down to. Um, so I had to, I, it, it doesn't hurt to definitely just take some time for yourself to just think about any experiences you might've had in clinical or at, like if you're an NP and you were an RN before, like any experiences that you might have that may add to your, your um, gamut of experience because ultimately just as much as you wanna be a part of them, they wanna they want make sure you're a fit for them too. So they have to be able to see that you are going to be able to kind of rise to what their expectations are of you. Um, and I will definitely say that there is a formality that may make it more intimidating at the actual interview when at the end of the day, just like Joe said, they know ultimately that you're gonna be a new grad and there's, you're, there's gonna be a learning curve and there's gonna be a knowledge gap and that's normal, but it does help to be able to kind of think about your own experiences that you might, that may help you in your new role. Mm -hmm. Giselle, I think you're muted. Um, so I don't see any questions in the chat, but if anyone else has any other questions, um, please feel free to just go ahead and ask. If not, we'll um, break out into the rooms in, a, in like two more minutes. I don't see any more questions. Um, so we're gonna go into the breakout rooms um, where you can continue the conversation with individual panelists and their specialties. Um, so how do, it'll work is you can choose which room you'd like to go into and you'll have about 15 minutes to ask questions, to, to ask any more questions to the alum. And um, it's a good opportunity to network as well. If you're unable to choose your room for whatever reason, just stay in this main room and um, Jana will place you into a breakout room. She'll ask you and then be placed. <laughs> 